Hello and welcome to a new addition to Office Hours, a podcast started at previous News Hour Extra interns last summer, in which we invite professors to talk about their thoughts on recent news, their works, or questions that students and educators may have about their specialty subjects. My name is Jacqueline Kim. I'm a junior English major at Amherst College and an intern for PBS News Hour Extra this summer. Today, I'll be talking with my fiction writing professor, Professor Mient, an award-winning author of two books and numerous short stories about the creative writing process, publication of work, and practical advice for aspiring authors. This is going to be a long conversation, but it's broken up into sections by topic, so you can skip to the topic of your choice. Let's begin. Could you introduce yourself, Professor? My name is Thierry Yoshong-Hit, and I am a writer and also a professor of um, English and creative writing at Amherst College. I think I put this in my final portfolio um, for class, mm. but I did used to do it a little bit, and I'm sad that I don't have any more from around that mm-hmm. time. So I was thinking um, maybe it would be a really... I feel like it could be kind of a life-changing thing if people just have things they wrote from when they were children and um, obviously later too. So I guess to start, do you think that like um, creative writing should be introduced to children as like a formal subject or like a, um, like a pointed focus in their learning? Um, do you think everybody should do it um, whether or not they... <laughs> Uh, whether or not they identify as writers or not? Uh, I mean, I think that I feel hesitant to use the word should mm-hmm. <laughs> for, you know, in, in any situation, but particularly because I'm not, like, an expert on early childhood education or anything like that. Uh-huh. But speaking from my own experience, um, I loved writing as a child, and I wrote for fun um, mm-hmm. all the time. But I, I remember that some of the most like important experiences I had with writing was doing it for school, like doing creative writing for school, which I did in grade school, mm-hmm. and um, you know, like getting feedback from my teachers and getting encouragement from them. And also, I remember one time in sixth grade. We had this sort of small project where we not only wrote our own stories, but we also like basically workshops mm-hmm. um, another student story. Where it was like a lesson in like revision, and we had we got a chance to read like another student story and like give them feedback. And that was really like my first introduction to workshopping, and I really loved doing that, like editing, as much as I loved writing. And I think those are very like formative experiences for me. So. Personally, like, I think, like, getting that sort of positive external validation Uh around my creative writing in school at an early age was really helpful Um, because it's hard to continue writing just on your own when it doesn't feel like it's taken seriously or it's not, it doesn't feel like um, it's part of your education, you know, it feels like, quote, unquote, fun. Uh-huh. Uh, it feels like a hobby or a pastime. Uh, and so it's kind of nice to have like my hobby and pastime be validated like in school and taken seriously by my stu- by other students and by my teachers. So yeah, I mean, I think that in general there should probably be more funding for like arts education in elementary schools, period, in this country. Yeah, uh, for sure. <laughs> um, then... What do you think is like a good realistic way for anybody to kind of incorporate the writing practice into their daily lives? Um, I think one thing that I focus on with my like fiction one students is setting realistic goals, which is something that is hard to do at first. Mm -hmm. Um, So I have my students that I have my students set a goal at the beginning of the semester. Um, and then they reevaluate halfway through and then reevaluate at the end of the semester. And I think that's really helpful because um, you don't always know what you're capable of <laughs> um, just starting off until you actually try it, you know? So I think it's realistic to like 
set an initial goal, but sort of keep in mind that you should, you'll probably end up having to revise it later on and mm-hmm. not seeing that revision as a failure, but sort of as like a moment of growth and actually as like a type of success because it means you're getting closer to being able to um, sustain your goal. So, for example, I hear that advice often thrown around that, like, you should kind of write every single day. And I don't think that's, like, advice that works for every single person, right? right. For every person's schedule. And maybe it, it, it might work for someone for a few months, but then maybe it won't work after that because they get busier or they have family obligations or something comes up. Mm-hmm. So I think, like, basically just being flexible with your goals, being uh, willing to sort of you know adjust them to your needs um and trusting that like i don't know like writing being a writer has more to do with i think your intention than it has to do with like what you're actually doing like for example if someone doesn't write for like two years mm-hmm. i think they can still consider themselves a writer as long as like that's something that's important to them, that's something they want to return to later. I don't think you need to be like writing every single day um, in, in order to like feel like you're a writer, feel like you're an artist. I see, yeah. Um, I had a question, but I think I forgot it <laughs> um, <laughs> about what you just said. Um, I guess then if we could shift a little to your own personal like writing process because um oh i think i remember so the thing about writing every day might not work out for everybody and you said when we don't necessarily meet our initial goals um to not see that as a failure and to see that as an opportunity um to kind of get to know ourselves better and for growth and I when I was in your class, I personally did not keep to my initial goals at all. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But I um what I did was when it was about a week or a week and a half before the day that my manuscript was due, I just sat down and like um <laughs> cranked out a story like almost in one sitting, I think, like one wow. or two sittings. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, I realized that like if without that pressure, I just don't create, <laughs> and mm. I was kind of surprised at myself, like um, how much work I can actually get done if I have this pressing feeling that I need to get it done, and so I was yeah. wondering, um, because you're a writer, and um, yeah, how do you? Like what what does that process look like for you and do deadlines help you at all or do you set your own deadlines because you um you are your own author like I'm just curious about the mm. writing and publishing process I think deadlines absolutely are helpful to me but returning to your story Jacqueline mm-hmm. like I could really relate to that because a lot of the time that's kind of how I function too like my writing where I'll procrastinate for a long time. Uh-huh. Um, like, for example, with my latest book that's coming out next month, uh-huh. um, I started writing it, oh gosh, let me try to think when I started writing it, 2016? Wow. Um, I think it was 2016 I started writing it, and in about the first three months of beginning to write it, I wrote like half of it. Uh-huh. <laughs> in, in like the first three months and I was on a roll uh-huh. um, and I, I was like I felt really good I felt like I was going to finish it probably I could have finished it in the next three months you know mm-hmm. but then um, I won this contest for a manuscript in progress and it kind of put a lot of external pressure on me and it made it it basically made it difficult for me to finish it because I started thinking about the publication process before I'd even finished writing and that was very distracting mm. and gave a lot of anxiety. So for the next um let's see, like four years <laughs> mm-hmm. or okay, like three years, I just procrastinated on this book. So up until I finished it last year in twenty twenty. So uh-huh. between my like, twenty sixteen and twenty twenty I was just dealing with a lot of writer's block, like procrastinating um, feeling anxious 
And then I finished the second half of the book, probably in another three month period. Oh, right wow. Before the deadline. <laughs> you know, and uh-huh. so on the one hand, the story is that like, oh, I actually wrote the whole book over the course of like six months. But that's not true, because I had to write it over the course of Oh gosh, not 2016. I'm, I'm sorry, that was wrong. 2018. Mm-hmm. 2018. No, time is off. So it took about two years. But uh-huh. really, it took two years to write. Um, it's just that, like, those 18, I can't do that. Yeah, 18 months <laughs> when I wasn't, like, physically writing, that was writing too, because I was working through stuff emotionally and mentally that I needed to work through mm-hmm. in order to have those really productive, like, six months of writing. You know? So, I think that something that I hope I got across to you guys in class and something that has been true for me is that the writing process is a lot more than just putting words on the page. You know, there's a lot that goes into a story or a book um, that isn't just about the physical act of writing. A lot of the time it's about the brainstorming, it's about the like emotional and mental work that we're doing on our own to I don't know, bring up the courage or the excitement um, or the energy to mm-hmm. start writing. I think that whole process counts as the writing process, you know? Oh, um, that's interesting. I don't think it's fair to say that only the moments when we're like physically putting words on a page is writing. Um, so that's kind of my take on it. And now I've forgotten your actual question and whether or not I even answered it. <laughs> oh, no, that, I think it did. I think it's really interesting to think that writing is not just that moment when you put words down but it's also all the time you spend thinking because I never thought about it that way and I sometimes like have these huge nebulous ideas about you know what I want my writing to uh, you know sound like the style and if I want to um there are certain scenes that I've made like scenarios in my head that I've made up that I can't wait to put down but don't necessarily Mm -hmm. know how to connect to the story and also like these kind of grand idealistic like I want to write the best story about this out there and like I guess it's really comforting to think that all that thinking and fantasizing and idealizing is also like part of the entire process so I guess like how do you go from all that you know like abstraction to really how do you narrow it down and finally put it on the paper do you think if that's not too difficult of a question i write a lot so not only is the thinking part of the process but Mm -hmm. like for me the book that you see you know like the whatever the 300 pages that make it into the book Mm -hmm. it's like 10 percent of what i actually write Mm. you know so i i'm a person who like writes by hand and writes a lot like I overwrite I kind of do maybe even like pre-writing where I won't stop myself I've done this with you guys in class too where I was just saying like you know write for 10 minutes straight and don't stop Mm -hmm. don't erase anything so I'll do that but not for just 10 minutes for like an hour I'll just do like a pre-write and so I create a lot of a lot of words um and then my quote unquote actual writing process where the where the words appear on the page is when I take all of that handwritten stuff and I kind of like edit it out onto like a word document. And mm-hmm. that's when I that's when I think that's that's a part of my process that probably looks most similar to quote unquote writing <laughs> that other people do. Because that's when I'm actually like I don't know, um, being a little bit more thoughtful about what I want to say and, and where the story is going or where uh, my ideas are going. Um, so I don't know. I think for me, and then that's just the first step. So write by hand, put on the word document. And then I also have a very like rigorous editing process where I basically read aloud everything that I write. Mm. Um, and we'll spend a lot of time focusing on the sort of like miracle and sonic quality of the work. Um, and then after that, there's usually a long period of time, like a couple of months that pass 
before I go back to what I've written on the Word document. And then I do another pass. And then that pass may um, consist of me, like, you know, taking out whole chunks of things um, Mm -hmm. and writing whole new chunks of things. Um, So it's a very long process. (laughs) (laughs) And not with the most efficient. I would say. <laughs> it sounds like a marathon almost. Like all that repetition. It's more like yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's weird though because it's almost like doing like a puzzle for me or something. Oh. Um, I get kind of obsessive about having it be exactly right. Mm-hmm. And by exactly right, I don't mean like it's the best thing ever or it's perfect. It just means. It, it feels closest to what I'm trying to convey. Um, I don't know if you've had this experience with editing too, but sometimes I write something and it's close to what I want it, what I want it to be, but I know something's off about it. So yeah. for me, it's a process of like eliminating that feeling of something being off until there's more, until it feels like what I've written is close, very close to what I feel or what I wanted it to be. Um, mm-hmm. Do you and that's kind of fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. I think I'm. I'm actually. I have this huge list of Virginia Woolf books I need to get through before going abroad, um, in this fall. And I was, I'm in like, the end part of the voyage out, and I realized that. Oh yeah. Yeah, I I realized that I'm somewhat of a, like a passive reader, so I tend to actually. I don't know how I managed to do this. I'll read the words on the page, but I'm thinking about something else in my own life. And then I, re- I realized that like I have not actually read. And so I have to go back and read it again. And yeah. Wolf herself is like, it's like so impressive how she describes such abstract things like so closely. So sometimes I go back, but I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And yeah. Yeah, so that I think kind of captures this, like the same idea of like trying to put into words what you're thinking and like uh, not really knowing if you are saying what you want to think and not really knowing if other people will hear it. So do you think it's more important to you that you um, say what you want to say or that other people understand what you say? when you write? Mm. I think for me, I don't really see it as a choice between those two binaries, mm. right? Like, I don't really see it as like, if I'm true to myself, I'm going to be more inscrutable to other people. Mm-hmm. Um, like, in my experience, I feel like so, firstly, Wolf is also one of my favorite authors, and mm-hmm. I should give her as my major figure for my PhD comprehensive exams, which means that one of my exams was only on Wolf, and I had to read, like, all of her work. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Um, and, and so, I think the reason why I really like her as an author is precisely because of what you just said, Jacqueline. Like, mm-hmm. I really love the ways in which she can describe something that's maybe familiar, but mm-hmm. in such an idiosyncratic way that is so unique to just her mind. And yet, in my experience, like when I read that, I kind of connect to it. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if it's because we're similar thinkers. I don't think it, that's necessarily the case. I think it's more because it's really exhilarating for me to see a glimpse into someone else's mind. And yeah. To, to like feel like wow I now kind of understand briefly what it's like to be you mm-hmm. um, you know and I think people talk about like writing creating empathy a lot of times and I think they usually mean that in a very simplistic way like oh I read a story about an Asian American person so now I understand what it's like to be Asian American mm-hmm. but for me it's a lot more complicated than that I think it's, it's more about those like moments where I have a glimpse into the inner workings of someone's like mind or even like their heart. And mm-hmm. 
it's a very vulnerable moment. It's a moment of connection, and it's really exciting because hope is good, and mm-hmm. I still feel like I understood a little part of it. Sorry if you can hear that in the background. That is my baby crying. Oh. Um, <laughs> but um, anyway, I think that for me, like, what I want to do is connect with my readers. And for me, I think the way to do that is to kind of, like, take apart conventional language, mm-hmm. which I think actually separates us people from one another. Um, this mm-hmm. is what I think people often mean when they say cliche. So what is a cliche except like um, kind of a placeholder, like uh, a statement that is so hackneyed, that is so uh, commonplace that it's really kind of lost its meaning. Uh-huh. And it's really not a very precise precise description of someone's experience anymore. Like that's what a cliche is. Mm-hmm. So what I want to do is I kind of want to like get past that sort of like commonplace language, the things that we say to one another that um, actually like obscure how we really feel or what we're really going through, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So, and and I think that a lot of times in our daily life, we engage in this sort of language all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, we say like, how are you? I'm fine, how are you? Like when someone says they're fine, like I actually have zero idea of what they mean by that, right? right? That's actually, like, not a moment of connection at all. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's fine in daily life because it's hard. It takes a lot of work to be vulnerable. And I don't think we could get through our day, like, being completely vulnerable to every person who asks us how we are, <laughs> right? But for me, creative writing is an opportunity to sometimes do that. Mm-hmm. And so what I'm trying to do in my writing is that I'm trying to get past the conventional language and trying to get to, like, how I actually feel, right? And trying mm-hmm. to convey that to the reader. And and so for me, like trying to convey exactly how I feel is not untypical to like the person, the reader understanding. Uh, because I actually think that the more precise, the more idiosyncratic my language can be, uh, the the more honest and attempt at communication I am making. And I think that if I were to try to cater to the reader and try to anticipate, like, what might be uh, understandable to them, that would, that would entail me, like, relying upon more conventional language and, like, making assumptions about the reader and, in a way, kind of, like, I don't know, pushing the reader even further away from me. Mm-hmm. So that's why, for me, like, I think being true to myself and trying to convey what I want to convey is actually a way to like connect with the reader and to make sure that they do understand me rather than you know like a way to be um, obfuscating. Mm-hmm. So it sounds like it involves a lot of trust in your readers, even readers that you have never met before, to kind of understand that you're your own person, even though they're their own person, and so you might say something in your writing that they will not get, but they will understand that it's your experience and um, I guess appreciate you for being honest to them in that in that piece of writing. Yeah, I guess, I think that's a good way of putting it. Um, yeah, I just don't want to make any assumptions about my reader, right? Mm-hmm. So the only assumption that I guess I make is that if they're reading me, then <laughs> like, <laughs> Then they're being, I feel like for me, it's like if they're reading me, then they're giving me like some of their time and respect. Mm-hmm. And like, I just want to be respectful in return. For me, being respectful to someone is like assuming that they're as smart as you, they're as attentive as you, and, and not kind of like dumbing things down for them. Mm, yeah, that's a great way to think about it. Then, Obviously, like, there's a lot of readers that you don't even know who are reading you, but um, who you, who do you think is, like, or who would you say is, like, a really big personal support to you in your writing, and how important is that for any writer, but especially, um, I guess, I guess, yeah, to the, to go back to kind of um, um, encouraging this practice for, like, younger people, like, do you, yeah. yeah. Who you would say is like 
your biggest help when you go through the process? Um, I mean, currently, I think my biggest help is probably my husband and my students. Uh But I think when I was younger, my biggest help was probably, like, my classmates and my teachers Mm -hmm. and, like, my friends who I exchanged writing with. Like, um, you know, I really think that writing happens in a community, Mm -hmm. even though it is, like, an individual practice that we do. I think that the workshop is such a valuable space because it allows us to, like, not just share our writing, but also share, like, our insecurities, anxieties about writing. Um, and and also to look critically at others' work and our own work um, without, like, while the you know, without, without taking things personally again. And that's not really the mm-hmm. point of it. Because we do take things personally. <laughs> and maybe it's, it's like taking things, um, taking, learning how to take criticism, I think is so important, you mm-hmm. know? Um, and I think I've learned that from my classmates and from my, from my professors and teachers over the years. Um, and so I think that for me has been extremely helpful. It's just like, it's when I first started writing as a child, you know, when I was like 10, mm-hmm. I didn't want to change anything. I thought my work was perfect, <laughs> exactly how it was. Uh-huh. Um, and I, I wouldn't take it personally if, like, I read my story to my sister or something and mm-hmm. she thought it was bad. I'd be very upset. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think it's only through, like, sharing and work with people, um, taking that first step that I've learned to um, appreciate feedback. Hmm. So it sounds like even if you like enjoy writing by yourself, uh, having a community will really help you like push yourself to the next level and become even better than if you were just doing it all on your own. Yeah, and I think it also creates like a purpose for the writing um, because I don't think that, you know, publication needs to be the goal or the end all be all mm-hmm. for a piece of writing. I think um in a different class that I've taught, I've had my students reflect at the end of the semester on like the afterlife of their stories, like what they want to do with them. Mm-hmm. And a lot of students wrote about wanting to share it with like their mother or giving mm-hmm. it to their friend as a birthday present. And like I think those kind of small gestures of sharing are just this powerful and important as like publishing something in a magazine or even in a book you know mm-hmm. um, and so yeah I think for me part of the community is a way to like birth your story into already a space of sharing into already a space of like communication uh, mm-hmm. so that like you know even if you don't end up publishing your story somewhere You've already had people in workshop read it, connect with it, and like spend a lot of time with it. I mm-hmm. think that that's very special. Yeah, for sure. Um, I know you just said that publishing isn't everything, but I'm still kind of curious. Um, what did it feel like to publish your first piece of writing? Um, man, <laughs> <laughs> it felt really unreal. Even though I say publishing isn't everything. That's mm-hmm. me saying it now and having already published work, you know. So right. I, know that, <laughs> uh, I have I have the privilege of having something um, in order to do it when I push it. But yeah, I think it's been my like lifelong goal to have a book published. I always wanted to be a published author. And so it was really unreal to see those books in person. But mm-hmm. at the same time, it also felt kind of um, like anticlimactic, I guess, oh. because I think that's when I that's when I realized that publishing wasn't the goal. I had to publish in order to realize that. If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, like I had to accomplish that goal to realize that maybe that wasn't actually my goal all along. Um, because I think my goal all along was just to like write. <laughs> uh-huh. You know, it, it was just to write. And the publishing is wonderful because it's given me a chance to connect with people and I'm so 
like honored and flattered all this week. <laughs> I mean, for someone reads my book, I still can't get over it. I can't get over the fact that a person actually read my book. I like, spent that time with my writing. That mm-hmm. makes me feel, I don't know, I'm just so surprised by that. So having readers is, is incredible. It's such a gift. But um, yeah, just like publishing itself, I don't think it's really changed my writing process that much. That's pretty encouraging, especially for people who just want to write as a hobby, but are not so sure if it's kind of worth it. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Wow. So it's like, it's like, it's cool, but it's not everything. Yeah, exactly. It's cool. And I mean, to be class, because I was in academia, Mm-hmm. And because I was pursuing writing not just as my my hobby or like as my um, creative outlet, but as like my career path. Mm-hmm. For me, like publishing was important because it was tied to like my job prospects and things like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was cool, and I was really relieved because it meant I could get a job. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Um, on that note, like, do you have any, like, practical, like, kind of career-related advice for young aspiring authors? Because I know for me, like, I know she means really well, but my mom's always like, are you sure you only want to major in English? Like, do you want to, like, you want to maybe, um, I know, like, throw in a different major in there? Like, what if you don't get it? Like, how are you going to make money? That kind of thing. So, yeah, do you have any, like, um quote-unquote like real world advice for people like that like me yeah I mean my real world advice is that it is a huge risk Mm -hmm. um to pursue creative writing as a career um I I, so nobody really told me that oh when I was in college so I was like a first gen college student in this country my parents went to college but they went to college in Burma which is like a socialist country at the time like a socialist like dictatorship Mm -hmm. and so it was a very different process and experience when they went to college I don't think they even they didn't have the same like applications they didn't have the same system of majors and stuff Mm -hmm. so when I was going to college like I had like zero guidance from family at least Mm -hmm. you know um so my parents didn't even know what I was majoring in, and mm-hmm. they didn't care. They just had my complete faith in me. Uh, they just thought I was smart, and that because we were in America and not a socialist dictatorship, uh-huh. they thought like I could get a job. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know, so they had very like low expectations. They're like, "Oh, you're in America. Like nobody starts here. You'll be fine." Uh-huh. Um, and that's not true. People do start here. You know, uh-huh. but for them. It's like a land of opportunity, and so I think they just didn't have the same sort of like anxiety that a lot of um, effort that like a lot of like American parents have, or even like parents who are immigrants from other countries have. So basically, I had free reign, and I didn't know what I was doing either. So I just majored in literary arts because I wanted to. Mm-hmm. I had I did not think at all about what I was going to do post college, and I went to an Ivy League. I went to Brown. And there was this, like, feeling of being on the conveyor belt of success. Uh-huh. Because so many of my classmates were extremely successful. And I think I just didn't really consider, like, the practical, real-world, like, financial aspects of things. Mm-hmm. Um, until after graduation. So then I graduated, and I was like, okay, now let me try to find a job. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and at that point, it kind of hit me that, like, I was not doing so well. I could not find, like, a job. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I moved back home, and I did eventually find a job. Uh, my parents were dealing with some financial stuff at the time, so I was helping to support them and stuff. Um, mm-hmm. But during that year that I was staying at home, supporting my parents and living with them, um, I did feel very sad because all of my classmates at Brown had gone on to do amazing things. They got really great jobs. You know, they were traveling, and... I was just, like, living at home in my parents' apartment. Mm -hmm. And it really felt like um, I hadn't thought things through. And so that year that I spent at home, I became very ambitious. And I made, like, 
like a five-year plan uh, mm. like Stalin um, <laughs> and I okay, just kidding I love this recorded so I do not think I'm talking about them but um, I made like a five-year plan for myself and I was like okay so if I do want to be successful at this I really have to start thinking about what that's going to entail so I decided I wanted to be a professor mm-hmm. and like that meant I had to get an MFA. Um, I also, you know, probably want to get a PhD. So I just like made this plan for myself and kind of like followed it. Um, and luckily for me, it worked out. But I know so many people, so many writers for whom that did not happen. Mm-hmm. And I, there's nothing that makes me better than those people. It's just pure luck. Um, mm. and so I, I think that my advice to like people who want to pursue creative writing is that you have to be open to things not going your way. Mm-hmm. Like if you start off thinking, I want to be published by age XYZ, I want to have a professorship by age XYZ, mm-hmm. you're just going to be disappointed. You have to be open to failure or to changing your plan. Mm. Um, so for example, I have, I have friends who like still have another book published, but you know, some people have career changes or they decide to go back to law school. Some people, um, decide they want to teach high school instead of teaching for college. Mm -hmm. Um, some people are still adjuncting and trying to make it work. I don't know. It's just a lot of people are doing a lot of different things, but you have to be flexible and kind of like be okay with not making a ton of money. Uh, mm-hmm. And also, that entails not just like the older I get, for example, the more I'm starting to think about things like saving for retirement, and like <laughs> you know, saving to buy a home, or like saving money to be able to start a family. Like those are things that you might not be thinking about when you're 20, but when you're 30, like this starts to become more important. So you have to really consider like, will I be okay if not making enough money means that? I can't start a family when I want or maybe ever mm. you know like is that a sacrifice I'm willing to make uh, I don't know Mm, I feel like that sounds hard, but it honestly sounds a lot like other people's stories about their careers like even even like female doctors are like I have to maybe I can't um do other things in life because i'm I'm pursuing this this degree or um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it doesn't sound I, I mean, too honestly, much different. This mm-hmm. country is like really, it's a, it's a difficult place to live and make money. And like the myth of upward mobility is just a myth. Like, mm-hmm. my sister is a doctor, but, and so technically, like, one would think that she's going to have a ton of money. She's, but, but she actually doesn't yet because we didn't have, I mean, my parents couldn't pay for our college or for her med school. Mm-hmm. And so when she finished all her training, she had like the most incredible amount of debt that anyone oh, <laughs> has no. ever had, uh-huh. you know, and, and it's going to take like years and years to pay that off. Um, and so even when you have extremely high paying job of being a doctor, mm-hmm. um, if you don't, come from a family that has money or has some ability to pay for you to get an education, like you're still so far behind. Mm -hmm. It takes like generations, basically, I think for any sort of like upward mobility to actually happen. Mm -hmm. Either that or like, I don't know, someone becomes like a tech billionaire. Mm -hmm. But if you just have like a normal job, you know, like being a professor or being a doctor or being an engineer, like that upward mobility that um, is advertised is really kind of a false advertisement because it mm-hmm. takes like generations not just like one kid going to one ivy league for that to happen right i think that's really important for students to hear to not place these like really big and um kind of insurmountable expectations on themselves and then beat themselves up afterwards when that doesn't happen to them yeah exactly yeah. It's just about managing expectations, I think. And that goes with, like, managing expectations about your own writing and book and everything as well. 
Yeah. Yeah. And like, I don't think people need to for, like only do creative writing as a career. Like, I have friends who are like engineers and writers, or like doctors and writers. Mm-hmm. So, I actually think like I wanted to be a professor because that's what I've always wanted to do. Mm-hmm. I love teaching, and I love teaching in college, but. Um, you know, if that wasn't something I was passionate about, maybe I would have been like an engineer and still wrote books on the side. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that's like my biggest questions about, um, like the creative writing process and your experience and, um, I guess advice for other kids. I actually, I was reading part of um. Your book that hasn't been published. I'm not. I don't even know if I'm allowed to talk about it. <laughs> Am I? No, you can. You can. Because, okay. I mean, people have read it. People have gotten the um, advanced reader copies have read it. Okay. Yeah. Um. I was just thinking, like, it's. I I know it's nonfiction because it's um like a family history, but it read so like mystically to me. Like I could believe it was um like a made up character and I think I got past the part where you were talking about um you know if someone like I feel like I'm not the story I'm the storyteller and if someone were to write one about me then yeah I I Mm -hmm. thought that part was really poignant coming from yourself because you are writing that story and like Mm -hmm. I guess that was creative Nonfiction, correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's how it's marketed, right? Uh-huh. <laughs> that's how it's labeled. But I think you're picking up on something important when you said that, like, even though it's labeled nonfiction, it kind of reads, you know, as like a myth or as a story mm-hmm. or as fiction. I think that's because what I was trying for me like it's hard to make those distinctions between genres Mm -hmm. um and it's also hard to label something as like nonfiction, which has connotations of like truth and Mm -hmm. reliability um when i think that like all narrative is very subjective and it's very unreliable right Mm -hmm. um and and so even even like history, like even though it's called family history, like history itself is something that is all about narrative making. Very like much. There's no uh-huh. objective objective history that exists. It's just stories that we tell about the past. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think I wanted to really foreground that in my book because that's kind of how I perceive narrative, and um, I thought that was important. I didn't want to like create a um like a memoir-esque book that was going to pretend like it gave the full complete true story of my life Mm -hmm. yeah i think that one passage made it like a almost it was outright saying um this also might not be everything that i wanted to say i thought that was really like I thought that was really smart, <laughs> I think. Yeah, um, yeah, but that's, like, <clears throat> basically everything I wanted to talk about. I think I'll definitely okay. be able to, like, make a really nice piece out of this. So thank you so, so much for your time. Yeah, thank you, Jacqueline, for reading and for your questions.